last month we is a board certified onco- oncological surgeon in sri lanka and had four years of general surgical and four years of oncological training both in sri lanka and the uk currently he is working as a consultant surgical oncologist in teaching hospital purnagara Uh, he has the experience of managing many patients with wide variety of solid organ malignancies including breast head and neck upper gi colorectal hepatopancreo uh, pancreatic biliary endocrine gynecological and sarcomas so he conducts uh, general surgical oncology and breast outpatient clinics and uh, theater sessions uh, endoscopic sessions uh, very frequently weekly so Uh, he has been taking part in many multidisciplinary me- meetings as well in in this respect so uh, he has mrcs uh, ms and also mbbs in 2001 uh, so without delay may i invite uh, dr raste manasam to present the lecture thank you good afternoon sir and thank you very much for your kind words of introduction and again i would like to thank ksm for inviting me for this uh, lecture so like forget about medicine and talk about something else which we like to uh, watch and like to play we all know the sri lankan men have dominated world in cricket in uh, especially in 1996 they won the uh, the world cup and even after that for about one decade they were dominating the cricketing world apart from that uh, not many areas where sri lankan men have dominated apart from oral cancer now we are quite uh, high in the list in the prevalence of oral cancer we are only second to countries like papua new guinea and solomon islands if you take the sri lankan uh, data the latest cancer registry shows uh, the the oral cancer is the commonest malignancy among sri lankan men in 2019 they have about more than 2100 cases of oral cancer been diagnosed and it is the second commonest cancer among sri lankan only second to the breast cancer another interesting thing is uh, when you get the death uh, due to cancers it's only second to the lung cancer so it's quite a lethal condition of course i mean i don't need to uh, emphasize you about the uh, the Uh, etiological factors which cause mainly head and neck uh, and mainly oral cancers we all know i mean in japan there's a this is called national disease gastric cancer is regarded as japan's natural uh, national disease one thing because the uh, the incidence is quite high and second thing is it's related to their food habits especially smoked food and sri lanka is the same we i mean everything is in this uh, slide reflect our culture so it's a cultural disease to sri lanka as well probably we can call it a natural disease and other sad part of oral cancer head and neck cancers are now uh, if you take the stage of the presentation about 70% of oral cancers or pharyngeal cancers present in the late stage stage 3 or 4 this quite contrast to the most of the other solid organ malignancies in our country for example breast cancer we are quite happy to say about 70% present in the early stage stage of 2 or no 2 but oral cancers or pharyngeal cancers present quite late in our country so having said that i'm going to uh, talk about these areas in next maybe 20 minutes evolution of evolution of a patient with oral cancer imaging investigation and treatment planning especially the importance of having a multidisciplinary team meeting then the mainly the place for surgery primary site if not then reconstruction and what are the limitations in the our setup now this basic stuff as anybody comes with any kind of kind of disease to a doctor so we should go through a proper history and then examination so we are concerned about the primary site where the primary site what is the size of the lesion depth of the invasion and all the features of the primary lesion then the neck cervical lymph nodes and also treatment lot depends on the patient's fitness because most of these patients are having multiple comorbidities and they are quite old patients then once we make the clinical judgment we do endoscopic assessment which we call pan endoscopy to assess the upper ear digestive system because most of the uh, the the 
agents which cause oral cancers or pharyngeal cancers can cause cancers in the esophagus nasal cavity as well so to exclude any second primaries we have to do a thorough endoscopic examination of the upper aero digestive system then of course examination under anesthesia is a must that gives a clear idea to the surgeon or the physician who treats the patient what is the extent of the disease and of course you need to get a proper biopsy for the confirmation of the disease now once you make the clinical judgment then next stage is to stage the disease there are so many numerous uh, investigation modalities available but we have to be quite vigilant about most appropriate investigation especially in a play country like ours where the resources are not equally distributed and available so ultrasound scan of the neck is frequently done in our setup to identify the presence or absence of lymph nodes which is quite cheap and freely available investigation another added advantage is we can do a guided fnac with the ultrasound apart from that it's not a good investigation to identify the primary lesion ct of course uh, we all know it delineates bones very well so any head and neck cancer which uh, involvement of the bones either mandible maxilla or whatever the bone ct would be the number one imagine investigation which clearly demonstrates the uh, bony involvement of course mri is very good for soft tissue delineation mri comes the number one when it comes to soft tissue lesions in the head and neck area but unfortunately mris are not very frequently available in our setup so we often uh, bypass this step but this is the optimal investigation if you get a patient with uh, soft tissue tumor in the head and neck in addition to that it's quite good to identify the marrow infiltration if a patient comes with a lesion infiltrate in the uh, mandible the ct would show the uh, the bone involvement and mri would be ideal for the for, to uh, assess the marrow involvement so ct and mri in head and neck cancers go hand in hand so if the facilities are available it's advisable to get the both investigations done then of course pet scan which is again not very uh, uh, freely available investigation especially to the up country we don't have a pet scan in our candy uh, but there are a couple of pet scans in colombo in private sector as well as the government sector so there are refined indications to get a pet scan in head and neck, head and neck cancer especially if a patient comes with a cervical lymph node without a non primary which we call carcinoma unknown primary so in that case there is a major place for the pet scan apart from that there are there are other refined indications but it lot depends on the availability of the scan so once you diagnose and make the i mean uh, stage the patient then of course you have to make a decision what you are going to do so what the optimal way of treating these patients now majority of uh, head and neck cancers are squamous cell carcinoma they are inherently radio sensitive so radiotherapy almost equals the uh, surgery for squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck so you have to make a proper decision what you are going to do whether you are going to operate the patient or send the patient for radiotherapy with or without chemotherapy now there are some indications for example uh, if the patient is poor candidate if the patient is not fit enough for a major surgery of course there is no other option than radiotherapy and nasopharyngeal carcinoma often we treat with radiotherapy or any other locally infiltrated advanced head and neck cancer of course you have to think about the patient's uh, consent as well as patient's opinion about the treatment because we have to have a proper discussion with the patient of course which is not very commonly happening in our country there's a gain reason now we know we got lot of alternative medical practices in our setup so if you explain the patient now you got a cancer there it has gone to the masticatory step uh, space we are going to take the mandible out and take some flesh from the chest and going to uh, fill the gap and get some bone from the leg so if you tell all these patients patient the next day he will be somewhere like of dambulla where the vedha mahatyas are practicing so you have to be little careful in our setup because our patient population is quite different from what we are reading in the books then surgery now i am going to talk about the surgery now i would say head and neck surgeons are the most skillful surgeons 
because of the anatomy and the physiology of the area. We know the most uh, complicated anatomy is in the head and neck region. A lot of structures are flocked together. Now, for example, if you are doing mastectomy, it's simple, like, it's like taking a big lipoma out, right? Any untrained, unskilled surgeon can do a mastectomy because uh, there's nothing much important organs there. But in the case of head and neck surgery, of course, there are so many important structures. If you do a simple mistake, the results would be devastating. In addition to these anatomical complexities, there are physiological complexities as well, right? Breathing, mastication, swallowing, speech, articulation, facial expression, all done by the head and neck structures, and especially the aesthetics. In that case, reconstruction plays a very major role in head and neck cancer surgery because you have to give the patient back the near normal anatomical and physiological structures. Now these are the some examples of patients that we often come across. I am sure Sir has a lot of experience than me about these uh, scenarios. So these are the kind of patients I am going to talk about. Now this is the very first patient I encountered after uh, completing of my foreign training because I was posted as the first surgeon to Jaffna. So once I went there, I went on a Monday, the Tuesday one of the senior general surgeons told me, Rasita, I got a patient for you. Can you please operate on him? Right? So I didn't have any theater time or nothing, but I, he, he lended his uh, theater time. So this was the very first patient that I operated as a consultant in this country. I managed to do a, a proper resection with a margin. And you can see everything being taken out apart from the uh, most essential structures in the neck, namely the carotid arteries, all the other structures being taken out and did the reconstruction with a pec major plaf, which is only thing that I could do at that time. The patient did quite well and he went home and uh, I couldn't communicate with him because I, he was a Tamil patient. A couple of months later, the wife came to me and said, me with uh, broken singhali and she said the husband has started drinking again. So I'm not sure whether my effort has really worked well on him, but these are the typical patients that we come across in our country. Now surgery, as I said, uh, it's a mainstay of treatment. It should be a unblocked resection. You have to take all the tumor out with a margin and margin should at least be less than more than 0.5 centimeters and frozen section has a major place to identify the positive margins during the surgery and if the frozen section is positive we will like to get a bigger margin and of course for the junior doctors when you are sending the specimen make sure that you mark the the sites now as i said uh, reconstruction plays very major role in uh, head and neck cancer surgery my other two speakers will uh, elaborate a lot on the reconstruction because they are based mainly uh, on reconstructive uh, uh, the procedures reconstruction either soft tissue bony as i said we need to achieve the uh, functional outcome now in generally we talk about a reconstruction ladder but in uh, advanced head and neck uh, cancers we can't use the lower steps of the ladder, for example, primary closer, there's no major place, skin grafting is usually not done, and local flaps again can be used in early cancers, but not in advanced cancers. We often use pedicle flaps and free flaps. So what are these pedicle flaps? Pedicle flap means there's an arterial venous supply with a soft tissue, and we uh, use it to cover a defect created by the surgery. Now, this is a commonly used pedicle flap, uh, pectoralis major flap, depending on the artery and the vein, which is quite a useful flap. It's regarded as one of the work causes of the head and neck cancer surgeons, or head and neck surgeons, because it gives quite big bulk and quite reliable flap, because blood supply is quite reliable and can be used in many applications in the head and neck surgery. So quite versatile flap. So there are, I mean, so many surgeons in this country are trained to do a, a medical pectoralis major flap, which is quite useful in many instances, including trauma as well. So these are again a couple of patients whom we uh, did the pec major flap to uh, 
cause the defect created by the surgery. In addition to that, there are some other flaps as well, like latissimus dorsi muscle flap, which is again quite versatile and quite useful flap. And uh, submental, they are not very, uh, uh, they are, can't be used for very big uh, areas. Some other flaps as well. Now, then the next step is free flaps. Now, free flaps in the sense, what you do is you do a microvascular anastomosis. You harvest a flap with the artery and vein or two, and then anastomosis to a recipient artery and a vein close by the close to the uh, resected side. Now, this is a uh, quite uh, technically advanced uh, kind of surgery, which is uh, which needs quite uh, intense training because of the microvascular reconstruction. Now, free flaps, uh, the commonly used ones are, which you call radial forearm free flap, which based on the radial artery and the cephalic pain, which is quite useful in head and neck cancer surgery reconstructive procedures. It's quite uh, not very complicated uh, uh, surgery. I mean, uh, harvesting is not very complicated. It's quite big vessel. So uh, here we uh, have used to uh, cover a defect in the lateral uh, part of the, uh, the, the posterior uh, part of the mouth. And it's quite useful flap, even in the tongue lesions can do wide local excision with the margin and can be covered with the uh, radio forearm free flap. The advantage is, as I said, it's quite easy to uh, harvest because of the caliber of the vessels and quite thin flap, nicely uh, applicable to the head and neck defects. Apart from radial forearm, there are other free flaps as well and uh, like anterolateral thigh flap, which is quite commonly used by uh, Peradini, I know. And even pectoralis major lateral dosa can be taken as a free flap and subsequently do the microvascular repair. Then, of course, a lot of head and neck cancer surgeries involve bony resections. So, bone reconstruction is again a challenge which a surgeon has to face. And there are so many ways of reconstructing the bones in the head and neck which again I am not going to detail in as the uh, next two lectures are basically on them. So mandibular reconstruction is mainly done by fibular free flaps. What we do is we half the fibula with the peroneal vessels and anastomos to a artery and the vein at the proximity of the, the lesion or the, the resection most of the times for the facial artery and the internal jugular vein. It's again uh, quite versatile flap used in reconstruction in a lot of uh, mandibular defects. We can harvest the free flap with a skin pedicle. So if there are any skin defects in the head and neck area, we can use it uh, flap to reconstruct. So there are, I mean, so many applications, which again, I'm not going to uh, detail about. Now the Latest thing is called CAD or computer assisted designing. So this is called the 3D printing. What you do is we get a CT scan and with a special software, identify the area that the surgeon is going to resect. And that same data is fed to the computer. And then we got, would know what part of the fibula to harvest, what should be the length and everything. So this is uh, in the practice in Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm happy to tell because uh, it will give very good roadmap for the surgeon to plan this surgery before embark on. So these are again uh, computer assisted designing and when we are doing the modeling, we can identify exact basis where the surgeon should bend the fibula and everything will be planned before the surgery. So this is about reconstructive surgery. And third part, as I said, we have to address the cervical limb nodes. So often head and neck cancers uh, present with cervical lymphadenopathy, especially advanced head and neck cancers. So we have to know what you are going to do. N1, N2, N3 neck, it means when there are palpable metastatic lymph nodes in the neck, there's no other question you have to go for cervical block dissection. Controversy is when you get a patient with 
n0 neck when the lymph nodes are negative then of course it depends on the primary site of the tumor depth of the invasion so for example patient coming with a carcinoma of the tongue as there are very rich lymphatic system you might have to do you will have to do cervical block dissection at least supra or mohyoid you can if the patient is having quite early tumor without uh, deep, deep invasion then of course you can follow up the patient to see whether the patient is going to develop cervical lymph nodes and there's a place for sentinel node as well but it's not very sensitive or specific i mean accuracy is quite less compared to the sentinel nodes in the elsewhere in the body example breast so not very often done but there's a definite place for sentinel lymph node biopsy and again adjunct chemotherapy radiotherapy there's a major place again i'm not going to detail about uh, but uh, chemotherapy has a added advantage of control in the local disease which enables surgeon to do the proper resection now what to be the future now yeah the tissue engineering is coming in the in the in the practice uh, surgical practice so that will be again one of the uh, armamentariums that we can use in the future to reconstruct these defects and the transplants now we all know there are so many organs being transplanted in human body like kidney heart liver and also there are instances where the face is transplanted face is taken from somebody else and transplanted there are so many i mean case reports available now whether we can transplant the head in mythology there are so many stories about uh, head transplants but is it going to be a realistic thing of course there are people who are trying for that so there is a surgeon even though he is a european one he is in china he is uh, ready to do a trans head transplant and the other patient on the other picture is a russian guy now he is willing to get a head transplant but still they are talking about the ethical issues of head transplant so it might be in the in the practice maybe in uh, 10 20 years time so you can get somebody said then good after taking your head off so it might be a realistic thing years to come but where we are now these are the typical patients that we come across these again one of the patients who had a carcinoma of the tongue treated with radiotherapy and follow up he is coming with a beetle quit to the clinic so these are the kind of population that we are talking about so these are challenges uh, in head and neck cancer anybody who is dealing with in our country one thing as i said very high incidence and the second thing is the presentation is at the late stage and the patient population most of these uh, patients with head and neck cancers are men elderly men who are alcoholics smokers and beetle chewers who doesn't concern about themselves so it's very difficult to convince them to uh, get a treatment so that's one of the reasons why we get a lot of treatment failures and of course the other men and see is the alternative medicine i mean people still believe on the alternative medicine there may be some uh, some good practices as well but the often most of them are crooks so patients go behind them and lose their money everything and ultimately come to the hospital where we can't do anything and of course limited resources we are again i mean now now our resources are becoming more and more limited even the suture materials are not available in the hospital these days so this is again a big factor to treat it uh, treat for this patients with advanced neck cancers now i go back to the uh, the uh, cricket now over the years the dominance of cricket sri lankan cricketers have lost that dominance something very sad to say now we are nowhere in a international arena we are low down in the uh, the point tables so i think as surgeons or doctors or dentists we have to do the same for the head and neck cancers it's up to you to reduce the dominance of head and neck cancers among the sri lanka male so having said that i would like to uh, conclude my uh, uh, talk and again i'd like to thank uh, prof articular giving me the opportunity and everyone who was in the audience thank you very much
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rasita Manatunga, for giving that very comprehensive overall view regarding oral cancer and the challenges faced with uh, at the current uh, scenario in Sri Lanka. Uh, next, we have two eminent speakers from overseas, Mr. David Tai and uh, Mr. K.M. Tekeli. And uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Anushan Jaising, who is a trainee in uh, Kent at the moment, OMF unit, will be uh, introducing them. Uh, I hope that we'll be pay playing a video uh, containing that. Can we start on the video, please? Hello. Uh, I warmly welcome you all uh, for the Oral and Maxillofacial Symposium uh, in 44th Annual Academic Sessions of Kent Society of Medicine. It's a great privilege uh, to showcase our work in this symposium. I'm Anushan Jaisinger, a trainee fellow in East Kent Hospital Foundation uh, NHS Trust. I'm currently working in UK. Uh, I'm a trainee from Oral Maxillofacial Surgery Unit, uh, Peradeni. It's my great privilege and pleasure uh, to introduce Mr. David Tai for our first speech. Mr. Tai is a consultant oral and maxillofacial surgeon with special interest in reconstructive microsurgery. He graduated from Bentland Medical School in UK and uh, trained in Southeast India. Currently, he is working in uh, East Kent uh, NHS Trust, doing his uh, marvelous work. I would kindly invite uh, Mr. David Tai uh, for the virtual stage uh, for his talk. Good morning, my name is David Tai. I'm a consultant for a maxillofacial surgeon. Uh, I've worked with Annie Shan after the last two years and uh, our unit East Kent has asked me to uh, join your conference today to talk about mandibular reception and reconstruction. My talk will focus on uh, tumor ablation, uh, osteoradial necrosis, treating medicine related osteonecrosis of the jaw, and uh, with or without pathological fracture. I won't be talking about the pathophysiology uh, of these uh, entities, but I will be uh, describing uh, the reconstructive algorithms for managing mandibular pathology. We see uh, around 50 to 60 major head and neck cases uh, a year, of which uh, around 35 to 40 have pre tissue transfer reconstruction. Of the remainder, it's uh, often indicated to uh, perform lesser uh, bony procedures on the mandible as a, a surgical uh, means of uh, confirming tumor clearance. This talk will talk about cortical rim resection, rim resection sparing the uh, inferior dental nerve, segmental resection of the mandible, uh, including anterior body and hemimandible defects, hemimandible with uh, condylar defects, and subtotal mandibular two cases we will discuss. Uh, I won't show you uh, surgical videos. Uh, I think the audience uh, will have a, a good concept of what a cortical rim uh, resection represents. It's for those uh, tumours that rest on the attached um, mucosa, the keratinized mucosa of the mandible, uh, with the suggestion I, they can do a radio radiologically of uh, periosteal involvement. It's sometimes sufficient to, particularly in the edentulous regions, to once mucosal uh, Margins are completed uh, with, in our practice, monopolar uh, diathermy uh, and periosteum is um, in size circumferentially around the tumor. It's often sufficient to run a reciprocating burr just under the first millimeter or two of the cortex so that the periosteum is undisturbed on. Um, this, depending on the size of the defect, these tumours are often uh, 
neither large in surface area uh, or as described deep in extent and local and local uh, soft tissue uh, coverage is all that's required to um, affect a mucosal closure. A rim resection of the mandible um, usually involves either the dentate portion of the mandible or if in an edentulous segment that part of the mandible that is turned alveolar bone um, with the end being to uh, preserve the inferior dental nerve if possible um, and try and retain around a centimetre a centimetre contiguous cortical bone of the um, outer table of mandible and inferior cortex for, for bony integrity. In the same fashion, um, the mucosa is the size of the subperio and the periosteal layer is uh, cleanly um, is inside circumferentially around the tumour. Um, if teeth are to remain within the uh, receptive area so as not to disturb, so as not to disturb the tumour, the um, the bony cut should uh, be aimed just below the apices for a clean cut. Um, we use a reciprocating saw to do this, and again we aim to get, uh, we emphasize uh, aiming to leave a centimetre of continuous portent, uh, buckling and in theory to maintain the integrity of the jaw. Again, soft tissue coverage um, will depend on the uh, surface area, the uh, receptive portion, um, primary closure is sometimes possible, uh, nasolabial, uh, nasolabial factory reconstructors uh, frequently used in our department, uh, or, if this, or if the surface area of the defect uh, merits it, a consideration of a uh, soft tissue free flap is uh, and, uh, briefly uh, a recent case we have done in our unit a 65 year old male swim cell carcinoma judged to be T2 I show you a coronal scan uh, in the uh, T2 uh, phase showing early marrow involvement with an area of lapping uh, high signal lingual to uh, the mandible just beyond the mile high bridge. So this is dealt with with a room resection aiming to preserve the nerve, uh, the lingual cut being below the mile high uh, line of the mandible. So you can see the pre op uh, OPG, the squamous cell carcinoma, manifested through the socket of a recently extracted lower right seven. And you can see the post op view showing a, a uh, Larger dentulous segment with um, a missing area in the lower right quadrant. This case was managed uh, concurrently with a neck dissection, um, levels one to four, and a radial forearm free bone to close the soft tissue defect. Segmental resection, by definition, involves loss of continuity of the uh, bone. Um, we tend to uh, reserve this uh, procedure for proven tumours uh, with either uh, clinical evidence of inferior dental nerve involvement manifesting as numbness on the uh, lower level of the chin on the side of the tumour, um, obvious gross mobility of uh, associated dentition, uh, MR evidence of marrow involvement of bone corroborated with CT evidence of gross destruction of the, uh, of, of the bony anatomy. Um, I won't go into the, in the details of each and every tumor section. This is appropriate, but the aim would be within a centimeter, at a centimeter distance from the seed macroscopic edge of the tumor to create two continuous periosteal um, approaches, uh, both mesial and distal, to affect a, a vertical um, osteotomy of the mandible. Um, doing so early in the resection greatly, uh, greatly improves mobilization of the soft tissues uh, for um, completion of the submucosal muscular uh, dissection to affect uh, the removal of the tumor. Uh, single point at the end of the mandible where possible 
aimed safely frequently at box the osteotomy in a fashion to preserve the anterior cardiogastric attachment to uh, limit later um, swallowing difficulties. Consider the soft tissue requirements. We consider the uh, likelihood of later trismus, particularly when you're using um, muscle to line composite reconstruction. If you find fibrosis causes uh, medium to long term trismus, and a coron coronoidectomy is often performed prophylactically um, to mitigate against this tendency. Um, and is also done with uh, retromolar tumor. Uh, and dates not only a segmental mandibulectomy, but posterior and maxillectomy. Coronoidectomy in these circumstances, whether or not an obturator is planned, is usually part of our uh, operative uh, protocol. If implant restoration is uh, required, that will change our, um, that will influence our reconstructive plan. Plate fixation needs to be borne in mind when planning the cuts. We aim for at least three, if not four holes, both mesial and distal. Um, on the once the reconstructive phase of the operation is underway, we aim for a long span plate of at least two millimeters profile. Uh, if the buccal anatomy is distorted in our practice, that is an indication for um, either pre bending the plate using a 3D printed model of the mandible um, or a prefabricated plate uh, in a pre planned virtual plan. Uh, Set up. Um, we're cognizant of the anatomy of the ID nerve, mental nerve, and often, um, uh, with the exception of anterior segmental mandibulectomies, this is often sacrificed as part of ablative surgery. We're cognizant also of muscle insertion, phyloharginia glossus, phyloglossus, and anterior gastric. Preserving them where uh, uh, oncologically safe or endeavoring uh, to re, re hitch the lounge and the uh, tongue. In. Uh, musculature um, where this is impossible. Uh, tend to, so from the soft tissue deficits, we tend to um, for composite reconstructions after segmental mandibulectomies, we tend to treat any tongue or shall we say single extra subtype defects from requiring uh, thick tissue transfer, we tend to err for a deep circumflex ilia, um, bony flap with a substantial pad of internal deep muscle for um, re replenishing uh, floor of mouth, alveolar crust and buccal mucosa. Any surface muscle can be draped down buckly to the uh, bony reconstruction to cover the plate. Plate exposure is seen in our practice, and uh, lining the buccal surface of the pompous reconstruction, including the plate, helps uh, reduce this uh, plate complication of surgery. Occasionally, a spin paddle is also required for um, through and through defects. A DCI can be a ready source of um, two soft tissue paddles to meet this need. Um, DCI, in our opinion, is the uh, bony reception of true bony uh, uh, reconstruction of choice of implant uh, restoration is um, expected as part of the overall treatment package. Where the uh, soft tissue defect can be considered as being multi site so buccal mucosa, retromolar, lateral pharynx, floral mate, Large skin panels are uh, required. A fibula not only offers you a longer portion of bone, about to 15, even 18 centimeters, but also a, a pliable, thin, uh, vascularized skin paddle with one um, with one important caveat made. I look carefully on the CT angiography to confirm that there is the appropriate uh, serving. Uh, vascular periphery to serving the uh, skin in the region of the uh, skin and fat parts. Multi-site, multi-surface defects, I think if you're uh, requiring uh, 
many complex surfaces to be reconstructed. The uh, scapular system flap is the only, uh, only sensible solution if uh, independent mobility of the skin panels from the bony reconstruction is required. And I find that we, in our practice, we've used the tissue dorsi uh, for intraoral muscle uh, mucosal reconstruction and skin panels for actual defects. Uh, I'll show you a brief um, diagram of the deep circuit flat, flat with the uh, vessels track just under transversalis and uh, near the uh, uh, superior crest of the iliac bone. We just transgress within two centimeters all three layers of the abdominal uh, wall, the internal, the uh, external bit before rolling over the, uh, um, the ridge of the uh, superior crest to become uh, fat and skin perforators. Show you also uh, the anatomy of the scapular or subscapular system flat, um, where both the, um, the bone branches, uh, descending bone branch of the um, scapula, and the thoracodorsal branch going not only to the latissimus dorsal muscle, but also sending off the angular branch to the scapular tip, uh, can allow. Um, multi site, multi um, surface defects are newly constructed. The horizontal and vertical skin paddles come from skin perforators off the circular spectral artery, which is seen at this point. Of course, not all segmental resections require a composite uh, free tissue transfer. Um, for the, if the uh, patient is deemed simply unfit to receive. Um, Instruction or any alternative, a, uh, the gap can be left, although that will inevitably mean chin swing and malocclusion if teeth remain. A plate can be placed for space maintenance, but that plate needs to be more robust, at least 2.5 millimeters, if not 3 millimeters. But in our practice, what we've, we've realized the plate fracture rates are high over over years following surgery we tend to support the um, plate with uh, sorts plates spanning plus soft tissue coverage again is an option pet major and anterior lateral by three flaps being one uh, uh, solutions that are judged to uh, mildly reduce operative time and risk uh, patients who are doing inappropriate for um Object free tissue transfer. Of course, the gold standard in our hands is a, a two millimeter profile long span plate composite quick uh, reconstruction. And a lot of the clinical um, scenarios we're back to describe is this uh, is the solution. I've, we'll go through the these. Um, and it goes one by one. I, I do want to mention that occasionally we find ourselves in a difficult bind where the, the, the reconstructive options are limited, and yet because of our fear of plate fracture, we, we occasionally don't get used the common um, osteocutaneous uh, flap solution, the fibula, the deep circumflex, and subscapular arches system flaps. We use the composite radial forearm flap, um, which provides minimal amount of bone but we judge even that the bone healing particular bone healing as possible will uh, limit uh, late late factors. Before we get going with the clinical scenarios I put on a table which you, you'll be able to um, read in your own time comparing and contrasting the various cons, pros and cons of each flap. Um, Main uh, point I want to draw your attention to, and we've all, I've already alluded to the fact that DCI is our chosen flap. The muscle really is an excellent uh, replacement for fixed uh, uh, keratinized mucosa. The restorative dentists will much prefer uh, approaching um, healthy bone in the post treatment phase through adapted muscle than through uh, fat and skin, which is loose on the um, bone in the structure.
completely to pre-planning, and I've alluded to this already, but we'll play anatomy distortion, multiple osteotomies, in an effort to mildly increase operative time and way of mind. Describe a 64-year-old uh, female with SCC of the right body of mandible. She was a pre-planned patient uh, with a fibular flat implant. Accepted uh, area planned. The fibular strut and implant um, guide position planned. Uh, the cutting guides here. Um, which preempt the placement of screw holes in the instruction plate uh, away from the planned implant placement. A 28 year old female with a current glioblastoma of Afro Caribbean heritage, pre planning again, we plan a subtotal mandibulectomy with DCI free flat. The expanded mandible, buckling will expand the mandible is seen there, virtually mobile teeth. The receptive area is seen in red. The proposed reconstruction is seen, uh, two part reconstruction is seen using the unmarked uh, ILEP crest, which is shown there, maintaining the two millimeters from the anterior superior iliac spine as advised. 64 year old female again, SCC left retromolar the trigon. This lady was obese, and we judged a uh, hip or um, scapula or lower limb uh, harvest was impractical. Uh, because of mobility issues, she had a composite one free flat uh, to, to avoid plate fracture. You see that the um, the bone is very diminutive, and a, a wire, circumferential wire was needed to support a, a linear fracture through that uh, plate when um, when multiple drill holes were made to adapt it to the uh, adapt the bone to the wide span plate. In addition, in the post op phase, she fractured the radius. So, this, this uh, treatment protocol is, is a compromise. So, a 50 year old male with a current odontogenic tumor, 40 year old blastoma, he had high dental expectations. Again, a pre plan uh, case because implant placement was um, uh, part of his treatment. Uh, he had an anterior mandibular uh, resection with a medium DCI free flap and implant placement. You see the area previously treated with a Chenex uh, tumor uh, with, a proof, with a reinforced place, plate placed. That whole area is resected with dentition, uh, with second premolar to premolar, preserving the outflow of the mental nerves. A DCI flap with immediate implants is placed and the anatomy was chosen to um, faithfully reconstruct the chin projection. You see the implant placements there done to restore his arch in good bone. The, the um, cutting guards are demonstrated here as, as I say, with arrows protecting the outflow of the mental nerves. Uh, I'll show you the plan measurements and the cutting guides and the final implant placement in the bone with uh, the restored dentition. A 53 year old uh, lady with widespread full thickness dysplasia with transform distance in the floor of mouth. She required an auxiliary mandible resection. This, the fibula was um, segmented, and you note that the, the uh, anastomosis down in the uh, contralateral neck, a, a three part osteotomized fibula is placed, uh, a, a non bony segment. Uh, in the uh, retromolar trigone region allowed us to reconstruct the posterior magdalectomy that was done as part of the resection. And you also note here a box osteotomy uh, placed to re hitch the digastric to the uh, land synthesis area. Okay, I now present a 64 year old male, 11 years prior, he had chemo radiotherapy to a right tonsil tumor and was in follow-up diagnosed with osteoradian necrosis grade three of the mandible with a fistula and fracture. Uh, he was a pre-planned case uh, for osteoradian necrosis. He also had uh, 
uh, aspiration pneumonias, uh, for which he was recommended uh, defunctioning uh, laryngectomy. Our surgical solution was a body mandibulectomy and reconstruction with the scapula free flap using the latissimus dorsi on the thoracodorsal axis to uh, resurface the um, pharyngeal repair post laryngectomy. Uh, the collapsed mandible uh, you see here with ORN throughout the right body. The first planning step was to derotate the larger segment to restore his uh, lower mandibular midline. Um, the resection was planned and the uh, cutting guides uh, planned as you see. The right scapular lateral border was uh, uh, scrutinized for uh, the most harmonious uh, bony replacement uh, possible. And you see the planning guide for uh, this and the plate proposed screw holes uh, with the composite repair fully planned, uh, as you see here. The next case is a 70 year old male with an active background of renal cell carcinoma in um, uh, stable disease control on immunotherapy. He's also receiving donosumab um, for osteolytic um, bony metastasis, but that donosumab caused uh, MRONG. We pre planned his care. He, we proposed a subtotal mandibulectomy with uh, fibula free flap. The uh, pre op OPG is seen. The uh, symptomatic uh, mandible essentially spanned uh, both the body and the anterior subficial area, bodies bilaterally in the anterior, anterior subficial area. Um, that was uh, pre planned as a two part osteotomized um, fibula flap, the segments of which are shown here. Uh, the plate, which was a milled titanium plate, 2.5 millimeter profile, was planned, and the post op uh, result is shown. A six year old male with osteoradian necrosis of the mandible is our next patient. He requires a double body mandibulectomy. We will, in his case, aim to preserve viability of the anterior segment, which is dentate. And we're proposing a segmented fibula free flap uh, with a straddle area of uh, pedicle only, with the intention to restore both body areas with segments of the fibula. For our pre-planning cases, you would need high resolution scans of up to a millimeter and a half uh, slice, th slice thickness. Uh, we would consider intraoral scanning, uh, sending separate SDL file, allowing high resolution data from the dental arches to be fused with the uh, CT facial bone data. We ask for drilling guides and stents for placement of implants. And of course, a restorative cons dental consultant is needed to, to supervise implant uh, choice and position. That's the end of my talk. I'm very privileged to be uh, talking to you today. Thank you for uh, your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the next few minutes. We will continue with the. Thank you very much, Mr. Tai, uh, for your uh, lecture. Can we continue with the other video as well and then take the questions at the end? Uh, for our second presentation on the KSM Symposium on Oral and Maxillofacial Reconstruction, I would like to invite Mr. Emal Takili, who is an Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeon working in our unit. Mr. Takili graduated from Vent School in Turkey and he did his uh, medical and higher surgical training. He also uh, did fellowship in facial plastics. His special interests are reconstructive 
facial surgery and facial aesthetics and especially rhinoplasty. I welcome Mr. Tikili uh, to the virtual podium. My name is Kibal Tikili. I'm one of the consultant maxillofacial surgeons on the head and neck team. Uh, I work with uh, multiple uh, team members from ENT surgeons to maxillofacial. Um, and this presentation is requested by one of our favorite trainees, Anushan Jayasinghe from uh, Sri Lanka, uh, who's with us at the moment in our unit being trained. Uh, we'll talk about maxillary reconstruction and our take on maxillary reconstruction as a unit. We may be doing slightly different things to other units. And I believe uh, this would work for our patients in our own ways, in our hands, actually. Uh, I don't have any disclosures and I would be grateful if uh, you don't take the pictures of the patients. If I give you a quick overview, uh, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the maxilla. It's a complex structure. Um, if you think about the only dental bearing bone, uh, it's a bit more simpler. However, when you think about the surrounding structure, it gets really complicated in the middle of the face. And I'll touch upon that a bit more. We'll talk about the quality of life issues. Um, these cases, generally, the maxillectomy defects after oncological surgery is done for saving patients' lives. However, quality of life is really important uh, for our patients in our unit, and we give special emphasis to that. Uh, we'll touch upon that a bit more in the future slides. Uh, classification of maxillary defects are really important for us uh, because that helps us to record the things and we can communicate by using the defect classification. Uh, how we evaluate and plan for the reconstruction, as I said, our techniques may be slightly different than other units. Uh, we will talk about the possible reconstructive options. I will also touch upon the skull base management and I'll finish with some case presentations. If you look at the maxilla, it's a complex uh, bone. Uh, it's got a structure where we have the alveolar bone with the tooth bearing, teeth bearing segment there. And this is what we call a palatal shelf, which is separates mouth from nasal space. We've got complex nasal space and nasal structures above. And we also have the infratemporal fossa behind the maxilla with a lot of blood vessels and nerves. And we're specifically interested in uh, temporal uh, artery and vein, which may sometimes be used for microvascular surgery for uh, supplying uh, the blood flow into our free flaps. Uh, it is important the nasal anatomy because sometimes maxillofacial surgeons may not be so comfortable in the nasal structure as well as ENT surgeons. However, uh, we believe in uh, experience in this area would really help uh, for maintaining the quality of life uh, of the patients. Uh, as we explained, this is oncological surgery is done to save the patient, the patient's life. Uh, important thing, the top of the priority is wound healing and we can get these patients into radiotherapy. Now, uh, in our unit, most of these patients present with T4 lesions involving the bone. Uh, we are really keen on bone clearance, but if there are in order to improve the patient's uh, chances of survival, we're really keen these patients to get into radiotherapy. Now, the two schools of thought, we can say that or we just give them operators rather than reconstruction and get into radiotherapy quickly. However, we think that that in fact has a major impact on quality of life negatively. What we want to achieve is to give them the best quality of life related reconstruction, but if they need, we'll need to get them into the radiotherapy, which would help with the long-term survival. Now, apart from the first, first one on the top, the rest are related to the quality of life, establishing a barrier between oral and nasal cavities. This is also related to the mastication and swallowing. Uh, we want to patent, uh, maintain a patent nasal layer where in our, some of our cases we have to remove the septums. And if you remove a septum and block the whole nasal space with a flap, can be really debilitating for the patients, especially after a certain age, getting used to mouth breathing is not easy. Uh, we want to restore the mid-facial contour, and some cases we use implant rehabilitation. Uh, in our unit, we're not too keen to do dental implants after radiotherapy, but in some uh, planning cases, we may be able to give them dental implants beforehand. Uh, we'll start with the classification of the maxillectomy defects. Now, this is quite important for us because this helps us to collect data and helps us to uh, 
standardized our defects, but it also helps us to communicate in between the clinicians and helps us to plan the reconstruction. And we know that there are different classification techniques and methods. I really like the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering classification system, cancer centers. Uh, one of the reasons is I like this word limited maxillectomy where it doesn't involve the palatal shaft that we mentioned in the anatomy slide. And so in our own words, we call it medial maxillectomy where if there is a nasal pathology, you may not need to remove the uh, dental bearing maxillary bone, but we may need to do a mid face resection. Now, some other classification systems doesn't include this type one uh, limited maxillectomy or we call it medial maxillectomy. Now, Type 2 subtotal maxillectomy is the commonest one. We preserve the orbital floor. Uh, type 3 is more of the removal of the whole maxillary bone with or without orbital eccentration. The orbital contents, if removed, it's called 3B. If it's orbital contents are preserved, it's 3A. Uh, and the type 4 is, again, an orbital maxillectomy defect without removal of the palatal shaft. And I will show a case of this one as well. Uh, we know that from the UK Liverpool team, uh, Professor Brown has a well-known paper on classification systems, and it's based on the vertical, vertical component and a horizontal component. This is quite useful, especially the horizontal component, to decide whether you want to do a operator or not. However, this is more designed for oral cancer extending into uh, the mid-face rather than dealing with the isolated nasal or mid-face pathologies. So, but I think both classification systems should be used and the, and the armamentarium of the surgeons and especially the trainees and is really relevant for the exams as well. If you look at the planning for reconstruction, now we do a multidisciplinary team approach. So we have on our team radiologists, uh, ENT surgeons, maxillofacial surgeons, oncologists, but in addition, we have quite a few allied health professionals that work very closely. These are like speech and language therapists to help us with the swallowing and the speech. Uh, patients will be seen and in close contact with our clinical nurse specialists. We have two on our team, Sue and Abby, and they will help supporting the patient a lot. This is a difficult life event where patients get their part of their face removed as for oncological reasons. And we want these patients to be supported as much as we can want to save the patient's lives, but we also want to maintain their quality of life. And in this aspect, the patient wish is really important in our unit. Uh, some patients in the last even few months told me that they don't want an operation. Um, this is perfectly acceptable as long as these patients have multiple meetings and we discuss these with our allied health professionals and within our multidisciplinary team approach. We call it head neck MDM and every decision will go through the MDM will be discussed first in our meeting and will be discussed with the patients. We like to give patients options. So I will discuss patients, their operator option and a free flap option if appropriate. Uh, we'll also do quite a bit of detailed work on our imaging because some of these can be really complex and it's a three dimensional complex area, slightly different than around mandible. Uh, we like to produce stereotographic models where we can have a look at the model and see in our hands. I also saw a picture on our anatomy slide, a, copy, a picture of a skull. And if I do a complex resection in a mid face, I will always take that skull with me and we may need to have a look at whilst we need resection, especially around the orbit and skull based regions. Uh, we have multiple reconstructive options and the most well-known one is obturators, a prosthetic reconstruction or restoration. Sometimes we can couple them with implant retained prosthetics. Uh, we like this kind of thing. However, one of the problems we're having is uh, some patients don't like it. it. They're not easy to manage uh, and they can sometimes be difficult, but we'll look into the advantages and disadvantages of operators later on. Now, the next level that we want to discuss is local and regional flaps. And uh, our trainee from Sri Lanka, Dr. Jaya Singhe, uh, talked about a lot about temporalis flaps, and we did join cases together and with Dr. Jaya Singhe, and is quite specialized in head and neck reconstruction in these areas with the Sri Lankan experience. And temporalis flaps really work well for us as well. I sometimes mix them with the um, free flap and use it more for skull base reconstruction. Uh, or for simple cases, we use buckle fat pad 
a, a nasal labial flap, a palatal island flap, which we used last week actually. Uh, a hadith flap is again for skull base reconstruction. I will touch upon that. Now we use free flaps, and this is, we think, will become one day gold standard, or it may be already gold standard because we give the, as much as we could the quality of life to the patient back. and. They're pr pretty uh, useful way of reconstructing uh, the defects, getting the patients into radiotherapy as soon as possible, as well as uh, giving them a quite a bit of quality of life back. If we start with the operation prosthetics, advantages is short operator time, short hospital stay. If there is this argument that you can better visualize for surveillance, which I sometimes agree. This is a traditional teaching, however, in the current day and age, we're more want to reconstruct the area and treat this and leave this as an isolated life event, get the patients over this rather than dealing with the operator related quality of life issues with their older life. But this is just a different perspective. This is our unit's perspective and the different surgeons may have different perspectives in this area. Um, helps in speech and swallowing. Now, one of the disadvantages, the main thing is that sometimes the retention may not be good. There may be a hypernasal speech, but I know that it helps with the alleviating the symptoms of hypernasal speech in most of the cases. Regurgitation of food and fluids in the nasal cavity can be a problem. And I have seen patients managing it difficult, especially after radiotherapy, the cavities can shrink. And I'll show a case where a patient's nasal reconstruction completely shrank in these situations in the uh, end of the presentation. And these operator, operators may need repeater adjustments as well. If you look at the different stages, you have to construct different operators. There's an immediate surgical one, there's post-surgical immediate, intermediate one after a few weeks, and there's a definitive event eventually. Uh, if you look at an example case, this is a type 2 uh, memory sloan catering cancer center uh, maxillectomy subtotal uh, an operator uh, cover plate for initial use uh, for the silicone putty to be applied into the cavity uh, and this is the final operator for that patient and then patients some patients can use this quite efficiently and they don't have any problems and i'll show you an example of a surgical operator this is multi-piece surgical operator which could be uh, dismantled easily and this is used to put some blue silicone patty on it and we close the defect and it would act quite efficiently we will be working for this patient for quite a few weeks i give you another example here this patient didn't have maxillectomy however had a quite extensive mid-face resection this was a type 4 orbital maxillectomy with preservation of the palatal shelf, uh, patient had a reconstruction with a uh, lat dorsus skin island flap and the muscle. Uh, now we're moving more away from the pure soft tissue reconstruction for these cases, and we want to put bone in there, especially for the contour, improving the contour, as well as prevent this complete sagginess of the face. If you look at the face, it's completely sagging down because of the gravity. And we, when we put a prosthesis on this, this was a, a glue retained, a sticky glue retained prosthesis. It worked well for this patient for some time, but this was managed, difficult to manage because the whole thing was sagging more and more uh, throughout the months. Uh, however, I prefer more uh, orbital implants and more separating the orbital cavity from the facial surface and giving the orbital implants to the patient and separating the orbital cavity helps us to maintain a better aesthetics for the orbital prosthesis. As you could see here, this was an isolated orbital resection, uh, but it was a good one to uh, showcase. Yeah. Now, uh, if you go to surgical reconstruction, local and regional flaps, I will speak about the simple flaps and I'll take on these flaps as well. Uh, if you look at the buckle flap pad, this is the most basic. It's used for a uh, type 2 case where we have the antrum open if you want to prevent an oriental fistula. Uh, we prefer to use this flap and it works well. It's got a good blood supply. Um, we just need to be slightly cautious in a deep aspect where you could get the buckle branches of the facial number. but it works well in select cases. I, I like to couple it with the palatal island flap. It's based on greater palatine artery. Uh, it's a 
flap, which could be rotated more than 180 degrees on the basis of the greater palatine artery. Uh, now, this could be dissected as a true palatal island flap. And I, if the, I'm doing a low level maxillectomy and antrum is open, I like a double layer closure, one layer with a buckle fat pad flap and maybe using a palatal island flap on the surface. And then these flaps are quite versatile and quite reliable. And after doing once or twice, they're not too dif difficult to do a vascular dissection around the pedicle. Uh, we occasionally use superior base nose label flap if you're running out of options, if it's really complex defects and if you have to cover it. Uh, we can push this into the maxilla, a two-stage flap. And there are cases that this helped us to uh, save us from uh, difficult situations. Temporary flap is uh, quite a well-known versatile flap. Uh, it's based on a deep temporal uh, pedicle. It could be put into the... Uh, directly into the defect through a high maxillectomy. It could also be used for skull base sealing, which we used uh, it for last week for a case, actually. Uh, we just need to be careful about the facial nerve, and they can cause some hollowing in the temporal fossa. Now, Haddad flap is, again, another flap is uh, quite a bit of uh, well-known flap for ENT surgeons, and it's in their armamentorium. I used occasionally for reconstruction of the skull base defects. It's the branch of a sphenopalatine artery, it's the septal branch, and it's quite versatile. It requires some nasal skills to dissect it off the septum. However, if you do subperichondrial, it's not really too complex. And if you're used to dissecting the septum, it's not really that difficult, but it works really well for the skull base double layer closures. We go up to the macrovascular free flaps. I'll go through the free flaps slowly. And these flaps, I will explain a bit more our take for the maxillary reconstruction as well. A workhorse flap for every head, neck, a macrovascular reconstructive surgeon radio forearm free flap. You can do a fascia cutaneous or you can take it with the radio bone. It's quite versatile flap. It's got a long pedicle, which will be very relevant for maxillary reconstruction because you're far away from the neck uh, recipient vessels. Uh, you can take large spans of bone and very reliable pedicle. And this works really well for quite a few of our cases. The only thing is sometimes it can be, especially in the elderly population, can be very thin and, mal and malleable. And we may sometimes need the bulk, and in those cases, we would prefer to do it from somewhere else. Nibble osteocutaneous flap is again a very useful workers' flap for any mandible reconstruction, longest span of bone available. A pedicle length is not bad, but in order to improve the pedicle length, you have to shorten the bone length, which means that you can drop the vessels into the neck, and we have to be aware of the fact that this is pedicles, although everybody thinks that the pedicle length is okay. I have seen cases if we extend the reconstruction more higher parts of the mid-face lateral nasal wall, uh, pedicle may be a bit shorter. So we always have to have a backup plan of accessing to superficial temporal artery and vein on the side of the face. And then this can happen from some time to time. This, the bone is suitable for small implant placements as well. Now, ALT flap, in our unit, we like to use the ALT flaps. We use it as a perforator flap, so it requires a bit of skill to dissect the perforators. However, very important addition to this flap is a vastus lateralis muscle flap. This could be raised as an isolated vastus lateralis muscle flap, which is not a perforator as described through the perforating to the muscles. It's more of a, a muscle flap. It's pretty reliable. It's easy to uh, raise. And it is very versatile, very quick fix for uh, not complex, simple defects of maxilla. The surface lining mucosalizes very quickly in a few weeks' time, and it really works well for some of the patients. I have a, a recent case where we were able to actually construct a denture for this patient without doing any implants for a subtotal maxillectomy case. Uh, if you use a Skin Island, it could be designed as chimeric. Now, we were, we prefer to use it as a perforator skin island, and we use this flap for our tube reconstruction often, pharyngeal resections as well. And it's quite a reliable flap, but it requires extended ex extra skills of dissecting the perforators. 
Now, the CIA flap is a good one as well. They said Ali Akbar flap with the internal oblique uh, muscle. Now, it can be sometimes torturous to dissect the vessel. So this flap, also one of the problems is this short pedicle and requires quite a bit of microvascular uh, experience, in my opinion. And in select cases, we use it for anterior maxillectomies, but we're moving more towards the scapular tip flaps because the pedicle is much longer and much easier to dissect, actually. Uh, there's good stock of bonus, the advantage of this flap. For pre-planned cases, this works really well. If you're planning to place the implants at the time of the raising of the flap and the, at the time of the main reconstructive procedure, and the implants will uh, have enough bone stock for this kind of case. And I also like the muscle component because the whole muscle will mucosalize and will become the mouth lining and it really works well for the patient's rehabilitation actually. Now we're moving slightly towards the subscapular system flaps. Uh, these are based on the circumflex scapular artery and the branches and they can be taken as a whole multiple paddles or more with the scapular tip and a lat dorsi side, which is much easier to dissect. Patients will require some shoulder physiotherapy afterwards. And if they're using all the paddles, there's sometimes risk of kinking of the pedicles. And we had this like a simple compartment symptom, syndrome, uh, compartment, uh, compartment problem where the uh, stitches were tight and the blood vessels were kinked and we were almost losing the scale island the patient had needed salvage. So we have to be careful with a lot of skin. Uh, the pedicles will be crossing, crisscrossing each other on these in these flaps. But we've been using a special scapular tip for anterior maxillectomies. It's quite simple. We, there are cases we placed implants at the time of surgery. It's the stock of bone is not as good as DCIA. It's somewhere between a, a fibula and radial uh, bone, actually. Now I'll touch upon a skull base management. This is quite complex for us because we don't have a new surgeons in our unit. That means any skull base CSF leaks, exposed skull base, we have to deal with it. That there are certain cases that you may have uh, dehiscence in the skull base, especially the superior orbital. Uh, roof of the orbit, which may be just a natural thing, or during the resection, you may cr create crack lines going from the etmoid root to perpendicular plate up to the skull base. It's a common area for a CSF leak. And the CSF is, there are cases that we were able to see this dura and repair the dura directly with 6-0 sutures and do a multi-layer closure on there. However, there are also cases the CSF leaks through in between the uh, uh, bony cracks and then we use the double layer closure in addition we may not be able to use any suturing in those cases now a uh, Harvey Cushing described this as a fat graft first and the tissue glue over it I use fat or muscle I use both in the past uh, we use tissue glue tissue and you can see a uh, flow seal a uh, specialist one for Duracell for um, in, uh, one of the companies is a specialist one now i like to use a second layer with a pedicle vascularized flap on it i use either hadat or temporalis in our unit with our team we use either hadat or temporalis flaps also if we have a free flap we will also put a third layer of the part of the free flap in that area to prevent the uh, csf leak in the uh, following pre-operative post-operative days our team is really keen on this skull base management with my uh, colleagues actually and in order to prevent any meningitis or any related complex uh, complications uh, we give the patient usual measures of bed rest and no straining and be careful and until now, apart from one case, we didn't have a long-term leak throughout the years. If I come to the case presentations, I will present a few cases and discuss the, the reconstructive mentality behind them. Uh, first one is a skin cancer case. This was quite an extensive skin cancer involving the uh, left uh, eye as well as the left maxilla. Uh, patient needed a type 4. Type, type 3B uh, memorous lung catering, uh, type 4 uh, orbitomaxillectomy. I mean, this is a, I do mention it's type 4, but in this case, uh, as you would see in the next slide, we took the palatal shaft as well and, and we reconstructed with this with a scapular free flap. If I go back to the case, it involved the eye and the maxilla. Patient needed a neck dissection for access to the blood vessels, resection of the facial skin, maxilla, and exantration of the eye 
and we were able to get to the anterior cranial fossa and luckily there is no CSF leak in this case. Uh, but we were had the necessary means to uh, reconstruct the area if there was. A, if you look at the, some of the uh, pictures, if you see this is an intraoperative uh, picture of the resection on the top left, uh, as you can see the orbital cavity here and you see the mouth and the tube uh, in the mouth. Uh, over the cavity and also tube in the mouth. Uh, you see the uh, subscapular system free flap designed for this case with multiple patterns. This is lactose muscle. Uh, this is a scapular tip. This is a lateral edge of the scapula and this is a skin island over it. Now, if you de design a complex multi paddle scapular flap, then you have to start thinking about how we're going to position this beforehand because the pedicle. Uh, the joint, the pedicle, the subscapular system pedicle may be short and you may need to come from the top to the bottom and design your flap in the way that the, the lat dorsi and the scapular tip becomes the uh, orbital floor and orbital uh, part of the reconstruction and the lateral edge becomes the uh, maxillary reconstruction and the skin island for the facial skin. Uh, this was a quite complex case. This has been two years patient refused to have radiotherapy and is valid and alive and he's going to have implants for the maxilla soon. Another case was a younger patient, is a 43 years old male patient, uh, poorly differentiated cytonasal adenocarcinoma. Uh, this was involving the anterior maxilla as well as the nose. So we have to do a type 2, two uh, maxillectomy subtotal as well as a rhinectomy for this young patient. We, we did, the patient needed bilateral neck dissection after this and radiotherapy and he had fibula free flap reconstruction and a prefabricated forehead flap where we implanted the cartilage grafts from the uh, rib cage into the forehead and used a rotation forehead flap for this patient. Now, this patient's reconstruction initially was really good before going into radiotherapy. He was complaining of having slightly larger nose and however with the radiotherapy it's an interesting case i'll show you on the next slide the nose completely shrank and patient lost the nostrils and required further surgery for the nostrils and the maxilla look at these apostopex uh, pictures uh, as you could see on the opg the maxilla reconstruction worked well he's due for his a uh, prosthetic restoration now however the nose completely shrank to our surprise and obviously this kind of thing can happen with the radiotherapy because he had to have quite extensive radical radiotherapy and at the moment we're dealing with a late reconstruction of the nostrils and the nasal passages as it has had a major impact on his quality of life. Uh, next case is an 80 year old female poorly differentiated SCC off the skin evolving the left eye. Now, this patient had a quite a large extensive metastasis in the left neck as well. And we had to arrange a orbital maxillary uh, maxillectomy with preservation of the palatal shaft. So the patient didn't have removal of the uh, palatal shaft and no breach of the mouth uh, cavity. Uh, the left eye was removed with orbital excentration and in more the skull base. Uh, now we we reconstructed this with a vastus and an ALT flap and the ALT flap skin was used for the skin defect on the neck after neck dissection and resection of the large met metastatic node in the neck and the muscle part of the flap is used for the orbital cavity and we use a skin graft on the surface. We also in order to maintain the left nasal passage we uh, arrange a left inferior turbinate flap and we rotated that and, and reconstructed the left nasal wall and a patient completely has now has a patent nasal airway and just recently completed the radiotherapy and these are some of the pictures from the clinic sent to me by the oncologist. Um, I can't, we can't see the left neck, however you can see that with the glasses on if she has some simple eye prosthesis this would really work well for her I'm hoping that uh, she'll be disease-free survivors years, years to come. Uh, I would like to thank you for giving us this opportunity to present our unit's experience. It's a complex area. On purpose, I didn't add too much oral cancer cases as I thought that I'll give a bit of a, uh, our experience in the more complex side of the things because 
if we add more complex oral cancer cases as well, then it would be a much longer presentation. I'm hoping that the audience uh, will uh, get some idea about our experience in our unit. And please do not hesitate to contact us for any inquiries about our presentation. Thank you very much. Are we online with them? Are they online? Connected? Yes. Uh, can you hear me, uh, Mr. Tai and Mr. Kelly? Can you hear me? Hello? I don't think they are connected. Yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you. Hello, thank you for you. We've been here waiting to speak. Hello, both. Hello, Hello Mr. 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 Tai and Tickley. Mr. Tickley. Yes, I'm here as well. We're just watching the Can watching you hear me? Video. We can hear you. Can you hear us? You're muted. You have to unmute from here. Can you hear us now? Hello? Hello, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear us? Can't hear them at the moment. Just the same view. Put the video on. Okay. Yes, go on. Start with it. Yeah. So, David, they can't, they're not hearing them at the moment. We're not hearing them at the moment. Look, there's two of us there. Is that part of the problem? No, I, I think because of the time factor, I'm very sorry that there's some technical issue. And. Let's try that one real quick. The last one, Mr. Last one. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear us? It's their side, Danny Sham. This, this is this working. Is Try now. Can you hear us now? Can you hear us now? Sorry, I'm sorry. Hello. We can. Hello. 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 Mr. Tai and Mr. Tikali, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Can you I'm hear us? Very sorry for the for the technical issue we had, and on behalf on behalf of the Candy Society of Medicine, we are very thankful for taking your time and joining with us. Actually, I myself is a OMS surgeon, which is I mean where I'm involved much of resections. So we have one eminent cancer surgeon with us. Dr. Dr. Uh, you want you to ask, want ask, 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 you have you any have questions, questions to ask? Ask the uh, Manatunga? Ask the question now. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear us now? Yeah, we can hear us. And uh, thank you very ah. much for both of you for a very uh, interesting two uh, talks. In fact, I mean, uh, we are still uh, in the beginning of uh, 3D reconstruction and even microvascular. We are not doing that often. What I would do is, uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, if I have your contacts through Anushan, then if there's any uh, major resection, I would uh, rather happy to have a second opinion from you and uh, discuss some cases. Is that okay with uh, both of you? Uh, it's a privilege to be asked. Of course, it is okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, both of you. And uh, actually, we we do some amount of fibular reconstructions, and we used to do DCIA flaps as well. But unfortunately, we lack the experience of uh, scapular flaps. I think uh, your our, our trainee, uh, Dr. Anushan, is in a very good center where this facility is being uh, practiced. So we hope to have that technology and sort of the expertise and, and, and to uh, use it in Sri Lanka. So 
I, I think uh, because of the time factor, again, I think we'll wind up here. And, and thank you very much for joining. And we'll be sending e-certificates uh, via mail. Uh, thank you very much then. Hello. Yeah. Thank you to you all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. And that concludes the OMF Symposium. Now, I cordially invite the President of Candy Society of Medicine, Professor Manjula Artigala, to give away the token of appreciation to our resource person for the day, Dr. Rasita Manatunga, Consultant Oncological Surgeon. And then I invite uh, Dr. Saman Nanayakara, consultant anesthetist, to give away the certificate of appreciation to our chairperson, Professor Manjula Artigala. Okay. And that concludes the OMF Symposium and also the first day of, a, of the annual academic sessions of Candy Society of Medicine. Please be kind enough to attend and visit the stalls the sponsors have put up. And also in the evening, we have the Bibile Memorial Oration by Dr. Pabasri Ginige. Until then, have a pleasant evening. Thank you.